Hi guys, I'm Sam, we're Ghana Bound, and today I have two people that I have been dying to get on the channel. They've got to be two of the most well prepared, <laughs> shall we say, on your wow. way on your way to come in. Can you introduce yourselves to the family? Hmm. My name is EJ Allen Nanaya. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Cameron, uh, Alan Kaiser, uh, Ajua and um we're we're most honored to be here on gun about absolutely it's definitely overdue and some of you that are keen of eye will know that we've seen ej coming and checking up on our building to make sure it will stay up and he is Ghana's premier property inspector all right trainer of inspectors this guy has got the knowledge deep deep down <laughs> cameron Introduce yourself to the family for me. Okay. Well, outside of being EJ's wife, uh, I'm also a real estate broker. I have a brokerage in Texas and a brokerage here as well. And I recently started Standout 360, which is a virtual tour and media company. Fantastic. Thank you so much. How long have you guys been here now? Oh, wow. Uh, since 2020. Yeah, four years. It was four years on March 5th. So we're a year behind you guys. Okay, so you're OGs now, right? Oh, man. <laughs> we're little people. We're little people. So how have you found your move? Why did you come? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, I guess to make the long story short, um, you know, doing historical studying, um, you know, knowing about the transatlantic slave trade, uh, seeing on uh, the maps, uh, I think 1619, uh, where the area of Ghana, Gold Coast, then you see Slave Coast, um, you know, these things kind of, we had to come and, and, and try to see the slave ports and, you know, the whole uh -huh. nine. And so, um, you know, with that and Ghana being uh, formerly an English speaking country, um, it was a no-brainer to us to come uh, visit and the visit just turned into a long-term stay. Fantastic. And what was your reason for coming? Where did you come from? Ah, okay. Yeah, so we're we're Texas. We're from Texas. Texas. Yes, and uh, we always knew we weren't going to stay in the United States. Okay. Right. This has been long hours of pillow talk between EJ and I about how we're going to escape uh, the United States. And we talked about all different types of places, Mexico, Canada, you know, and we never really considered Africa. Uh, but it wasn't until we just got into research and really traced our roots back uh, here to Africa and specifically Ghana that we started to consider it. And it just so happened that my sister uh, was living here. She got stationed here. She worked for the embassy. Right. And so in 2017, I came and visited her for the first time, brought our oldest daughter, loved it, came back, told them all about it. And, and we decided this is where we wanted to uh, move. So in 2020, we just decided finally that we'll take a trip to see what we can see for two weeks. And um, then we, COVID happened and we got locked down and yes. got stuck here. You got locked down in Ghana. You know, um, they kept sending the emergency flights alerts, right? And they're like, this is the last flight. And this is the last flight. And so uh, eventually June came around and uh, my sister-in-law, she was like, you guys really need to talk and discuss on if you're going to take the emergency flight or remain here. And so uh, we went, we walked Oxford Street uh, in Osu. Um, and um, after 10, 15 minutes of walking and talking, we made the decision to come on and, uh, you know, relocate to Ghana. Mm -hmm. So unlike us, you guys decided not to stay in the center of Accra. Mm -hmm. I won't give away your location, obviously, but you're out there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Was that always part of the plan? Uh, no. When we got here, we thought like everyone else, oh, let's get something on the beach or let's live in the city. But we, we 
as you you hinted, as far as being prepared, <laughs> we were kind of like doomsday preppers, you know, and so we wanted a country type life. Mm -hmm. And so after looking at beachfront properties and all these different things, we settled on, uh, well, not settled, but more so the Eastern region chose us. Okay. We uh, got invited out there by a good friend of ours named O'Kinney, who is also a fellow uh, realtor. Mm -hmm. And he's like, just come out and come see, you know, where we're, where my family's from. And they just like adopted us into their family. And, um, Gave my son instant cousins and grandmas and grandpas and <laughs> and then um, EJ took a walk down the road. You want to? Oh yes. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a major road where we live at, and uh, I just left the hotel we were staying at and right. took off walking. You know, I wanted to see the land. I wanted to see the people. I didn't even tell anyone. I just took off. And so uh, at the end of the road, there's a, a huge mountain and uh, it's beautiful. And uh, I walked all the way back. And uh, before I could even break the um, go through the gate uh, of the hotel, uh, one of the workers says, oh, hey, your wife is looking for you. <laughs> and then here she comes. Where are you going? You didn't take your phone. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And, you know, I told her I just really felt led to, you know, survey the land. Mm -hmm. And when I surveyed the land, I saw it was flowing with milk and honey. And so uh, I knew it was confirmed that, you know, our steps had been ordered. And we have found the place that uh, we need to now take refuge. So you saw it's very fertile out there, right? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Really crazy. Absolutely. You know, uh, in the eastern region, uh, nothing but evergreens, corn, pineapple, uh, cassava, bananas, mm -hmm. plantains. They just come from the earth. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the change in your day-to-day -day life, let's say back in Texas and here now, is there much difference? What, what, what's it like? Oh, it's it's night and day. We were real city folks. We would go out to eat about six days a week, maybe. Um, we enjoyed, we just enjoyed everything city had to offer, you know, basically. And so we turned all that in and we're farmers. You're farmers? Yeah, we're farmers now. We have a aquaponics uh, farm. We have an aquaponics greenhouse. It's a 40 by 60 uh, structure that holds about six, uh, two, four, six, yeah, 600, up to 600 tilapia. Nice. And it can grow up to 2,400 uh, pieces of vegetables. And then that's what we kind of started with. And then we got into chicken farming. So now we have a little over 350 chickens that we sell for uh, eggs. And nice. we ran through turkeys and broilers and now we're into mushrooms. Right. I know you're very proud of your turkeys. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we have the best turkeys in Ghana. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, a lot of our clients, uh, customers, uh, they te they call me and they say, uh, hey, uh, are you importing these turkeys? <laughs> and no, uh, totally organic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, aside from the uh, antibiotics that you have to give yeah. uh, your livestock so that they won't have worms and yeah. issues yeah. and developing, uh, we... They're totally free, yeah. you know. Uh, we do keep them in clothes, but we give them enough space to where they can move around mm -hmm. and uh, be able to fully flourish. And right. so uh, you still want to, even in a free range setting, have some type of closed system so that you can ensure that they won't be susceptible to certain diseases, um, you know, make sure that they, you know, are clean and, and that you are able to, you know, just really control the environment uh, that they're in. And so, yeah, we have the biggest and best turkeys. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So in terms of the children, were they all, all in, all in as well? Did they want to come? How have they found it? <laughs> So, so there's five, five, three, three of them are still in the United States and two are here. The oldest and the youngest are here. Okay. Uh, our daughter Malachi and Elijah actually right now, uh, I would think they would say they're absolutely enjoying it. Our daughter is a, is a music director. She shoots okay. probably the biggest artists here in Ghana. In fact, she's on a shoot right now, uh, doing a King Promise video. Nice. And my son is working as her, uh, assistant. Mm -hmm. So nice. he's he's only fourteen getting this work in. He's fifteen. Uh, Sixteen. He's, no, he's no. not. He's 
He's 15. <laughs> He's 15. He just turned 15. He just turned, he just turned 15. 15. <laughs> yep. Um, and so That's amazing. Yeah, they're they're doing big things. I mean, this boy, he's been to the president's house. Like to eat dinner at the president's house. Nice. And it's like that, Ghana, right? It's mm-hmm. some doors that just open up. It's just like I feel that we have access to things that not necessarily we would have back in the UK or back in the States. That's absolutely Is that fair to true. say? Yeah, absolutely. I would never uh imagine my son uh, being invited to President Trump's or Biden's home mm-hmm. for a casual dinner, a nightcap, you know, um, being able to uh, network and meet uh, celebrities and musicians, you know, uh, those things are just not uh, as accessible, uh, especially in the States. Mm. And so absolutely uh, coming here, uh, being Black American, uh, has absolutely uh, allowed us to uh, be in some arenas that we normally wouldn't be in in the States, you know. And it took some adjusting, you know. Uh, in the States, we were kind of to ourselves, maybe mm-hmm. we're our family, you know, go to work, come home. But uh, since we've been here in Ghana uh, and the exposure and the areas that we're walking in, uh, it's a liking to like uh, when someone moves to L.A. Right. and they casually go into a restaurant in L.A. and they see a movie star. Yeah. You know, we're in, we're in a liking to that in the areas that we're in. And so um, it's it's been a, a, a surreal experience, you know, to be able to uh, have these individuals be interested in us because in the States, you more so are a fan and they kind of are kind of distant because mm-hmm. they, you know, they have all these fans. Yeah. But here, uh, the individuals, the celebrities, the um, they they have a, a more they're more approachable. Yeah. And, and they want to engage you. Yeah. You know, and so absolutely uh, more that, accessible. Huh? Uh huh. Absolutely. <laughs> so I have something to say about that because it's 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 a it's really a privilege mm-hmm. and it's something that you know i think our whole family admits and mm-hmm. is are grateful for because yeah. uh, as a black american in the united states we did not have any privileges yeah. we absolutely had to work very hard for everything not to say that we don't work hard yeah. here yeah, yeah. but we do have access to people and things that we just didn't have here but one of the first people that that we met uh he was the son of um of a prominent person who formerly worked for the UN. Right. Um, and they invited us out to, to their house. Beautiful. We didn't even know who, who the guy yeah. was, but he's a big deal. So we're, we're sitting eating dinner and we're just talking about how great it is to have such access and be able to meet people and how to, I think we said it's like a small world. It must yeah. be a small world mm-hmm. that we keep running into people. Yeah. And he burst our bubble quick and was like, no, it's not. He's like, you have a privilege. Mm-hmm. It's because you have money and you're in the places that, that you are, that you meet these people, that the average uh, Ghanaians isn't going to the restaurants that you're going to. And that's why you're able to meet people like, like us. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah. And we don't have money, oh. No. <laughs> no seeker, oh. Hey. It's not easy. It is crazy, and I do feel the same. It's like we do come in with a relative position of privilege. Um, we're not selling uh, pure water at the traffic lights. You know, we're not struggling like some of these miracle makers every day. They're just making it happen. I couldn't believe. I couldn't. I don't know if I could do it. But um, we're also not just kicking back and relaxing. I, I mean, we've worked on many things together. There's a lot of hours that goes into all of this. So, guys, do you think you've had to sacrifice anything being here? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, The biggest sacrifice for me is letting go of myself on uh, a lot of the expectations that I have. What were they? Uh, Well, some of them. (laughs) One one of the biggest things for me is kind of how business is done in this market. Right. Uh, you know, being in construction. Right. Uh, Today's video is brought to you by Kuro Africa. It's a complete game changer for anyone who wants to invest in Ghana. That's right. Say goodbye to guesswork, prices driven by your accent, and lack of information. And say hello to data driven decisions on your next investment in Ghana. Kuro has analyzed over 2 million real estate listings covering 4,000 unique neighborhoods helping you to compare location prices, 
view detailed price ranges, and even analyze historical trends for your exact requirements. You can even convert prices into major Western currencies right there in the tool. It's not only the data. Kuro has vetted featured properties that you can inquire about and view quickly their price against the rest of the market with the price indicator feature. Kuro also includes 17,000 schools, 4,000 hospitals, 1,000 attractions, and a growing library of infrastructure projects that could help you anticipate hotspots for investment growth. We all need that. Kuro even has population data, helping you understand the makeup of an area, the age and gender distribution, and even what people are doing for work and education and unemployment levels. Mm -hmm. But Sam, that's not all. Kuro has a series of insight articles and resources tailored to those seeking to move, to invest or do business on the continent. Kuro is your one-stop shop for in-depth insight for planning and executing smart decisions in Ghana and soon across the whole continent. Join the most informed investors in Ghana and try Kuro for free right now at kuroafrica.com. Let me be specific. Dealing in construction, um, working with laborers, contractors, things like that. Uh, the market that I come from, Texas, uh, it, it runs like clockwork, you know, um, and there's not a lot of uh, upfront monies needed. It's like if I if I commission you for a job, you get after it. And then once the job is complete, then I pay. But in this market, they almost want all of the principal, all of the monies up front before they do any work. And that's why I, I specifically wanted to do building inspections here. Mm -hmm. Because when you're putting up so much money up front, there's no real accountability on the contractors. Yep. There's nobody really holding them to a standard. Because, you know, they have reasons why they can't meet deadlines. They have reasons why the capital that you gave them is finished and you still don't have your work done. Yeah. And, you know, it's more of a, a cultural norm in this market. And so that has been one of the biggest things that I've had to uh really let go of and and be more patient and more trusting and yeah more trusting and and absolutely uh i've paid monies for work in this market and the work had wasn't completed and even in 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 discussing this injustice you know I'm left at the end of the conversation feeling like I'm the bad guy. Mm -hmm. I paid the money. Yep. I yep. gave you what you asked for. If you said 30% of the principal, I gave the 30% so you could begin work. And, and we understood to go to the next phase in construction, then I will pay this amount. But you, you didn't even complete the first phase, but now you're demanding the additional installment to go on to another phase of construction that I'm not confident because you didn't finish the first phase. And so a lot of my clients, this is why I'm hired here in this market, because they'll start to have this struggle uh, with the hired contractor. And then they bring me in to really uh, inventory everything year to date. So that way, if it goes to litigation in court, they have a legal binding inspection report that shows the judge or whomever, hey, this is the state of where my project is. This is the communication we have put forth. And this has been the end result. We got you. And so, you know, that has been a real culture shock for me. I just never uh, imagined that uh, business could be done in such a fashion. Yeah, it's totally different. It's totally different. And to to some extent, I don't know if you agree with me here, how much you have to hold on to 
your, you, you know, like your integrity, your service, your, you know, delivering, mm. and then how much you kind of have to let go of mm -hmm. because you're here. It's like, oh, it's, it's, um, it's an inner thing. <laughs> it's a lot of work. How about yourself? Uh, the question was the biggest sacrifice. You think you've had to sacrifice. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's strange because on one end, I feel like we've sacrificed a level of security. Mm -hmm. Um, just dealing like with like my mother right now, she's going through a series of health, uh, challenges. Um, in the United States, we just felt like it, there, it always seemed like there was some safety cushion of some, of something. Um, you know, and if we, if worse got to worse, we could go work at a grocery store if, if we wanted to, yeah. or if we, if we had to. So there was a level, there's a, the sacrifice is a level of security, but oddly, I actually feel the most secure that I've ever felt because everything is completely dependent on us. So because we're, you know, we're doomsday preppers, having that, that false sense of safety net that we had in the United States, which mm -hmm. is usually like the government or something like that, not yep. fully trusting in that, but now having to wholly hold ourselves accountable oh, gives, gives a, a greater sense of security act actually. So, you know, it's, it's like, I, I, we don't, we don't feel as secure, but when you look at the, the tangibles here, we are the most secure here that we've ever been in our lives. Right. You, you, you know, you live and you work in the United States. I sell homes. I've sold hundreds of homes in the United States. All these people call themselves homeowners and very few are actually homeowners. No, the bank owns the home and you are more or less just a, a rent to owner who is paying off this astronomical loan, uh, in hopes that you gain some equity in your property. And so, you know, we, we own, you know, a few cars. That was the pr pretty much the only thing that we actually owned and had a title to that we could liquidate and, and get. But here now, we have three homes, we have a farm, you know, we have two cars. There's, there's just so much more tangible security that we have here. Self-sustaining, we're off the grid. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we have our own water supply. Mm -hmm. We have our own food supply. You know, we're able to trade for things that we don't have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like my wife is saying, you know, there's a sense of security loss, but then when you really look at it, we're the most secure, you know? I got you. Mm -hmm. I get you. I get you. UK, we have a social service yes. network. Uh -huh. So it's, it's supposed to catch you. Mm -hmm. Here, you're responsible for <laughs> it yourself. It's mm -hmm. not, if it's not you or your unit. You don't eat. You don't. <laughs> you that's know, it. That's it, you know? But on the flip side, the government's not all up in your business. Right. <laughs> You know, Absolutely. so you can't have, I've said it a few times, you can't have systems and freedom in the same, in the same breath. It, right. it, the, the two things don't really work together. Another thing that I, I know is important to EJ, um, uh, uh, that I think is a, a sacrifice is, it's a sacrifice with relationships and family, yeah. you know, living here. Um, it, it, our family cannot comprehend they cannot comprehend why the hell we are here, <laughs> you know, and they feel like we have left and aban abandoned them. So, wow. so it feels it's, it's a sacrifice because we're doing it for ourselves. We're also doing it for them, but they cannot see that. So it, it's cost relationships. Wow. Sorry to hear that. So they can't really see the value in coming here or what, what is? No, they, okay. yeah, you know, yeah, what they think just Africa different. is about. Okay. We're living in a hut apparently somewhere without water. There's nothing really going on is what they're, you know, the Western uh, media has told them. It's like. It's powerful. Uh -huh. It's a powerful narrative that the, you know, the media and, and, uh, will happily push. Mm -hmm. And, and then in our family knowing like, we don't make the income we used to in the States, mm -hmm. hands down, we don't. And so, you know, that is a huge hurdle for a lot of our loved ones to understand, I you mean, know, yeah. they used to call him, oh, let me borrow money, borrow, no, I give it to you. Mm -hmm. That's how we were. But since we transitioned here, so much of our resources have mm -hmm. had to be 
uh, uh, we had to be a better steward of our resources mm -hmm. because the the <laughs> the the amount of resources is 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 minimum mm -hmm. compared to what we're accustomed to, mm -hmm. and so when we can't help them or can't send monies or can't just hop on a on a plane to go visit, you know they they begin to say, well, why'd you go over there, you know, and they and they respond like. You know, we made a mistake, but, you know, they don't know that we're totally self-sustaining. I don't worry about rent. I don't mm -hmm. worry about mortgage. I don't worry about a car note. Mm -hmm. I don't worry about electric. I don't worry about bills. Mm -mm. I don't. We don't have monthly bills. Yeah. You can come to Ghana and establish yourself and those typical woes that you have, yeah. that struggle, that hard knock life. You can absolutely cut that and, and have that freedom to where now spiritually, emotionally, I've gotten more connected. I know who I am now. And I found that because I kept working and I was making money in this, I didn't focus on me. Mm -hmm. But now I, I have found myself. And I know who I am and I know how to stand up to people. And I know when to say, I can't do something. That was yeah. something that I just couldn't do. I, I was a people pleaser, right? you mm -hmm. know, instead of a me pleaser. And so that, that is kind of one of the things that I, I know our loved ones, that's where that disconnect is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. But if they come and they visit, uh, one of my relatives came in November. Mm -hmm. She loved it and she understood. And she saw we weren't just living great. Mm -hmm. She saw that we were still uh, in the rat race, so mm -hmm. to speak. You can hit us up at www.garnabound.com. So if you like that, guys, please hit the like button, share it with a friend. And the best thing you can do to help us grow our channel is hit that subscribe button in three, two, one. Hey, welcome to the family and we'll see you in the next one. Hey guys, I'm Sam, we're going to bound.